wine of yours, moreover, you shall season it with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your mighty one shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. And then say you may, then say you could, and say you shall offer salt. Now, don't go get uh, Morton salt with the little girl with the umbrella on it and the blue label. That stuff will kill you. Get you, get you some sea salt. You're going to have to pay a little bit more. Why? Because it's higher quality. Get you, go to Whole Foods, go to Trader Joe's, go someplace and get you real sea salt and add that to your diet and watch things change for you in your consumption and your food. Don't use a lot because too much sodium is not good for you. But a little bit of bad sodium that has been stripped of its nutritional value is terrible for you. My auntie and them used to say when they would have too much, and, and I, before she passed away, her and I was talking about some little lesson to this. She used to say, oh, my goodness, baby, my salt done went up. <laughs> and I would, what is she talking about? Because the salt in her body was so much that her feet would swell along with the water that she would retain. And it's because she had an imbalance in her sodium intake. She was not eating properly. So make sure if you're going to use salt, then use the holistic, purest form of salt, that is sea salt, that you can use and create for yourself a balanced diet. Because when we get to Leviticus 11, that's all we're going to talk about for that whole night is a balanced diet, a balanced diet. Numbers 18, 19. Aki, could you read, please? I'm sorry. Chronicles 13 and 5. Second Chronicles 13 and 5. Second Chronicles 13, 5. Okay, I'm there. Let me read those lines. Mm-hmm. Okay. Should you not, <clears throat> excuse me, should you not know, should you not know that Yahweh Eloheka Yisrael gave the dominion over Yisrael to Dawid forever, to him and his sons, by a covenant of salt. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. So you want to underline that and write that down, because that is going to be relevant for the Shabbat lesson. And you want to look up the covenant of salt, not just from what you just read, what we just covered, but... Do you not know that Yahweh Elohei Elohe Israel gave the kingdom of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? Hmm. A covenant of salt. All this well hidden stuff in the scriptures that's always been there. And Reverend Rib never took us through these scriptures so we can see. Yes, tell her about the connection. Last place we're going to read this at out of the Tanakh is in Ezekiel, yes, Kael 43.24. 43.24. And then I'll give you two more scriptures that you can read for the next couple of days until we get together on the Shabbat. And we're going to go to Ezekiel 43.24, Aki, if you could read that for us. But then also your reference points, beloved, out of the Besora is the book of Mark, 9, 49, and 50. Mark 9, 49, and 50. Book of Mark. And you want to also come out of Metitiahu, known to us as Matthew. And you're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, and you're looking at verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Hmm. And it deals with a reference of salt. I want you to read that so when we have this lesson and the message on the Shabbat, it will preferably make more sense to you the significance of the Levitical covenant of salt and how it ties to David's kingdom and the covenant of salt forever 
and what Yahshua was talking about when he said, you all are the salt of the earth. Ezekiel 43, 24. Aki, if you could read that, please. Yes, sir. It reads on this wise, Ezekiel 43, 24. When you offer them before Yahweh, the priest shall throw salt on them, and they will offer them up as a burnt offering to Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So in the millennial kingdom age, right, when we, we are established in the land during the sacrificial uh, portion uh, of the kingdom age, there is, in fact, reference to these very activities that we've been talking about in Leviticus taking place in the Millennial Kingdom Temple. And if you want to read about the fashionings of it and all of the utensils and the workings of it, then it starts in Ezekiel chapter 40, and it runs through the entire end of the book of Yeskael or Ezekiel. Back to Leviticus, all right? So we've got to go forward into Leviticus. Now we're going into the third sacrifice, and that's the peace offering, all right? So the burnt offering is called Ola, or some say Al-El, Al-El, or some say Allah. I don't like using that phrase for obvious reasons. But, and the second one is Min Ka'a, Min Ka'a, that's the grain offering. The third one is called the peace offering, Salim. Salim or Shalom. Right? The fourth offering is the sin offering called Chata. 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 And the fifth offering is the trespass offering. Asham. 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 So we're going into the third one. And the third one deals with <clears throat> the peace offering. And it reads on this wise. When his offering is a sacrifice of the peace offering, if his offering is of the herd, whether male or female, his offering shall be offered without blemish before Yahweh. So right in your margin, a peace offering can be from, will be, shall be from the herd, and it can be male or female. And he shall lay his hands on the head of the offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting, and Aaron's sons, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood all around the altar. Then he shall offer from the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto Yah. The fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys he shall remove. So what he's doing is, this priest is butchering it, all right? And he is butchering it, kosh root, right? So when you, have, you hear other folks say kosher, K-O-S-H-E-R, the way you say it is kosh root, kosh root, right? He is doing a kosh root sacrificial offering. He's butchering it. It's going to continue to tell you how, just like when you did the, the chicken, or rather the chicken, the, the, my goodness, have mercy, because you're doing the turtle dove and the young pigeon, you had to wring his neck off, and you poured the blood on the side of the altar. Everything we poured the blood out, you turn the animal upside down, you slid it underneath all of its arteries, and then you inverted it so that the blood would drip out. You wanted it to be completely drained. If there was any blood in the animal, it was not kashrut. You cannot have any animal blood for your consumption, even in the sacrifice. It is unclean. All right? So those of you all who are still eating meat, right, if you're eating your bullock, right, and Elder Shadow and I used to love saying bullock. It was some bullock that came out. <laughs> if you're eating your bull, right, your beef, make sure that you are getting the leanest part of the beef and that it is organic. If you're picking up a package and you can turn that package upside down or to the right and you see by the gravity that that liquid forms into the corner and it's pink, that's blood. If it forms to the corner and it's red, you know it's blood. You are not to eat blood in any food. I have given the blood on the altar 
as an atonement for your sins. All right? In the blood of the animal is its what? Life. Because in the blood is spiritual energy. The blood is living. That's why it is moving through your body. Your circulatory system is moving. What do you mean it's living? You have what in it? Oxygen. Oxygen is breath. Breath of life. You cannot live without oxygen in your blood. When you've got oxygen in your blood, your blood is living. When your blood, and it's real simple, has low oxygen, the process of degeneration, meaning death, is increased. It is accelerated. Those who understand dietary codes and standards, when we get into this in the next few weeks, will understand Many of the brothers know this who are vegetarian, vegan, some who are raw, and many of the sisters know this who are vegetarian, vegan, who are raw. The more alkaline in your body, the greater the flow of the oxygen. Disease cannot live in an alkalized body. Y'all hear me? It cannot. So, cancer... Huh? Cirrhosis of the liver, glaucoma, all types of disease begins to wear down your immune system. The weakening of your adrenal gland, and I'm tying all this in. So you got to change your diet. And if you want your blood to be living, you want to put more oxygen in it. So that means more greens, more vegetables. Why? Because through photosynthesis, your greens and your green foods and your green vegetables have a lot of oxygen in it when you eat it. When you eat meat, meat does not have oxygen like that in it. And it's flesh. And when you eat it, it's not living like your fruits and your vegetables are. It's dead. So when you eat it, what are you putting in your body? Death. So what you're doing is you are promoting the degenerational process or the degeneration of your cellular structure by eating things that are not plant-based. If you want to live longer, you want to live longer, you got to change your diet. You got to go back and get you what I call a kayak. And a kayak is a living diet. That's what a kayak is. A kayak is a genesis based diet. Genesis 129 says, I've given you all the herbs, right, and all the trees that have fruit within themselves. Unto you it shall be used as food. When you're reading this here, we're looking at it, and the sister said when we were talking earlier, she did, she said, oh, my goodness, well, every time we come up with a sacrifice, it's what? It's something transgressional that we did. So something had to die because of our sin. You're slaying animals. We're eating animals to cook. and but so we we got to stop that. we got to make, as we reverse by the Creator's will, His power and His glory, reversing the curse. Part of that reversing the curse is to change your diet. We weren't given meat to eat till after we got off the ark. Genesis chapter 9. So Genesis 1 through 8, we were a plant-based human society. So... Eating fallen food will, pro, will, will promote death. Eating a food that is a food that is plant-based, that is in the Genesis diet, you will increase your life. And the proof of that is Genesis 5 gives you seven men that all lived over 900 years. And Methuselah was the oldest. He died at 969 years old, and none of the men ate meat. They all ate a plant-based, holistic, kayak diet. That's what they ate. They ate what I call a Genesis diet. They did not eat a Leviticus diet. This is Leviticus diet. This is for a fallen people. We need to recognize what stage of our development we were in. We were a redeemed people who were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were the descendants of Noah's sons, who were the descendants of Adam, and Adam failed. So we've got to turn around and let go a degenerating diet and get involved in a regenerating diet that will extend our lives. Let's move on through. 
Leviticus. Excuse me. Yeah. All right. Hello. Yes. Excuse us. Press, press. Hello. Hello. Question? Hello? Hello. Yes. Is there a question? Yes. 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 This Hello? is Kevin of uh, Memphis. This is Kevin in Memphis. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, this is Kevin in Memphis. I'm sorry for Go ahead. Yes, sir. Yeah. What about fish? Uh, is fish considered as meat? Also, because I know some people say it is, some say it's not. Uh, are you talking about a strict vegetarian diet? Good question. The word that is used in the English vernacular, meat, is a little bit misleading because when you read in the Genesis where fruit is mentioned, you will also find that the word that was there originally was meat or flesh, meaning the meat or the flesh of that fruit, and that meat and the flesh of the fruit are not synonymous with what we have now become to learn as meat being related to animals. I'm saying that a plant-based original diet is the healthiest way one could eat. Um, you can get your protein uh, and in another lesson I'll, uh, I'll teach is you'll get your protein from your beans and your legumes. So, example, when I make black bean supreme burgers, I get more protein from two black bean burgers in eight ounces than a person does in a pound of ground beef. And the difference is that it's a vegetarian plant-based protein and it absorbs quicker into your body so your body can use it for fuel where the meat though it, we've been taught in commonality it is healthier and you get more protein it doesn't absorb as quick and it takes almost 18 additional hours for your body to try to absorb and digest and then eliminate the red meat in fact most so-called americans or most people in the Western Hemisphere, even Israelites who are consuming flesh, have in their lower intestinal tract between 10 to 15 pounds of undigested meat. So we need to evacuate that. We need to take a colonic or we need to take a colon cleanse to eliminate that out of your body. Why? Because that will stay there and it will breed toxins and it, toxins will turn into disease. In regards to the fish, in Leviticus 11, it teaches us that you can eat fish, and the flesh of the fish is healthy. The fish that we can eat must have fins and scales. So that is the majority of your freshwater fish, your orange roughy, you know, your salmon, fins and scales. No catfish, no, now you got me going ahead a few chapters, but no catfish, no shrimp, no crayfish, no crawfish for you all down in Louisiana, wherever else you may be. All that, that is akin to the cockroach, right? It is unclean. It, those are sea creatures that are indigenous to the ocean bottom. They are scavengers, and what they eat is waste material. You are what you eat. So you want to put in you the healthiest, greenest, thing. With your fruits, you want your fruits multicolored. Purple, red, orange, green, all the colors in the spectrum. The more you put that in you, the, lo the healthier you'll be and the longer you will live. Don't buy into the satanic lie about you got to die from something. We got everything to live for. The kingdom is on its way. Don't be a participant in your own death and demise. If you're smoking, stop smoking. When? Right now. If you're drinking bad food, stop drinking. When? Right now. If you're eating bad food, put it away. Let that be the last McDonald's, last Wendy's, last Kentucky Fried, whatever it is, put it away. And you must learn to take your stomach out of the kitchen of your oppressor. He's killing you with fast food. And it's a co-conspiracy because the medical industry is in cahoots with the service industry. 
And all it's designed is to keep you sick in the hospital, feeding you with pills, which do exactly what they say it's supposed to do. You got a cough, what are you going to do? You get a cough suppressant. Really? Look at the word. Suppress? Suppress means hold in. You're going to go get a cough suppressant to hold in the inflammation. No. You want an expectorant. If anything better, get you some mullein, get you some ginger, and get you some garlic, and you make yourself a tea, and I can assure you in five hours it'll be gone. You got to go back to them old remedies that folk who didn't even know they were Israelites knew when your grandmama and big mama would go to the cabinet and she gave the cod liver oil, she knew what she was doing. Get you some cod liver oil, put it in your diet. Have you a teaspoon of olive oil every day from this day forward. Get you some blackstrap molasses. When we get into the lesson on the dietary code, we're going to break down all of this of what you should be eating because you are what you eat, and you're supposed to eat to live, not live to eat. Govern yourself. You can get by with small three meals a day. Not no great big old meal. And don't you dare eat past the setting of the sun. Well, I don't get home at 8 o'clock. Then take your meal with you because you make your digestive system work overtime. Your body begins to shut down on you. This is the temple of Yah, and the spirit of Yah dwells in you. And he who destroys the temple, Yah himself will destroy you got to take care of the temple that you got till you get the new one that's coming in the kingdom age. But we're not talking about no spookism. We're not talking about no hocus pocusism. And we're not trying to make you slothful by not taking care of yourself. You have been given that body as a gift, and you are charged with taking the best care of it that you can. Back to Leviticus. As y'all know, I get to talking about scripture, and it will be off in Revelation in another 10 minutes or so. Hallelujah. All right. In Leviticus, back to verse 6, it says, If his offering is a sacrifice of the peace offerings unto Yahweh, that is, of the flock, whether male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offers a lamb as a offering and then he offers it before Yahweh, then he shall lay his hands on the head of the offering and kill it before the tabernacle of the meeting. And Aharon's son shall sprinkle his blood all around on the altar. Then he shall offer from the sacrifice of the peace offering as an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. It's fat and it's whole fatty tail, which he shall remove close to the backbone. And the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails, the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached to the liver, Above the kidneys, he shall remove. He's doing some what I call precision-styled surgical butchering here. All right? It's kashrut. And the priest shall burn them on the altar, uh-oh, as food, an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. And if his offering is of the goat, then he shall offer it before Yahweh. He shall lay his hands on his head and kill it before the tabernacle of the meeting, and the sons of Aharon, the priest, shall sprinkle his blood all around the altar. Then he shall offer it from his offering, an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. Pay very close attention. The fat that covers the entrails and the fat that is on the entrails, the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them by the flanks, and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as food, as an aroma made by fire for a sweet aroma. All the fat belongs unto Yahweh. This shall be a perpetual statue throughout all your generations. In all your dwellings, Israel, you shall eat neither fat nor blood. Now, so you know how Granny and Grandmama and Auntie Sue and they, and they would sit up and they eat the chicken from Jimmy, whatever it's called, uh, Freddie's Chicken Shack? Or she'd get the gristle and they'd be chewing on the gristle, chewing, chewing, chewing. And some folks would eat. You're not supposed to eat that. That's not for your human consumption. That was used on the altar as a sacrifice, and all the fat belongs to the Most High. It's unhealthy for you. 
It has no nutritional value for you. And in addition to that, you violate that part of the Leviticus Code when it was dealing with offerings. You're not supposed to eat the fat. Somebody said, girl, give me the gristle. Oh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> we don't want no gristle. We don't want no fat. And we can't eat no blood. Don't you go out to, you know, Red Lobster, Benihana, you know, to the, we well, ain't going to find it at an Israelite restaurant at all. You know, if you go to the Soul Veg and you eat your meat, not that they serve meat, but you eat any of your meat and they bring it to you and somebody order medium rare. Oh, no, you don't. Most of your Gentiles, like, they meet medium rare. You're supposed to have your meat well done so there's no blood in it. And if you cut through your meat, you cut through your beef, if you're eating it, and you find that it's pink, send it back. You want it well done. You put your food on your barbecue, which is a type of burnt offering because that's what a burnt offering is. When you look at the altar, and we put the altar in the study guide, and you look at the altar with the four horns of the altar, and you look inside the altar, it had a mesh in it just like a barbecue grill. That's what it was. They would take the food and they would put it on the altar as a sacrifice and it would go up with the salt on it. It was a sweet aroma. And if you put corn out there, if you put any grain offering and all your offerings, you should offer it with salt. It smelled good. It was a sweet aroma. These are your customs, your practices, and a part of your heritage. This was not for the Euro Gentile descendant of Japheth, Ashkenaz, Edom, who is a Hebrew, but it wasn't for him who was red and hairy, it wasn't for Gehazi, and it wasn't for the Canaanites. These were for you, and they were part of your historical customs and past. Reading into chapter 4, as I always say, at the end of chapter 3, verse 1 through 17, may Yahweh add clarity, enlightenment, and edification to the reading of his word. Into chapter 4, because it's a little bit more lengthy, and I want to read straight through chapter 5 so we can come back and have a discussion as we're nearing the 9 o'clock hour. It reads on this wise. This is the fourth, the fourth set of offerings. So we went through the burnt offering, we went through the grain offering, and we went through the peace offering. Now we're going into the kata, the sin offering, and then next the trespass offering. So this is a little bit more lengthy. So bear with me. Chapter 4, verse 1 reads on this wise, and it says, Now Yahweh spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Benai Yisrael, saying, If a person sins unintentionally against any of the commandments of Yahweh in anything he ought not to be doing, and does any of them, if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt upon the people, then let him offer unto Yahweh for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. You want to highlight or circle that. A young bull without blemish is a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting before Yahweh. Lay his hands on the bull's head and kill the bull before Yahweh. Then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the meeting. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before Yahweh in front of the veil of the sanctuary. So this is not the outer veil that was the entrance to the tabernacle. This is the second compartment that's inside that covers the holiest of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. All right? It reads, And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar for a sweet incense before Yahweh, which is in the tabernacle of the meeting. He shall pour the remaining blood of the bull at the base of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. He shall take it, all the fat of the bull, as a sin offering. Okay? Remember, all the fat of the bull and the bull, it is a sin offering. 
the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat which is on the entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove. As it was taken from the bull of the sacrifice from the peace offering, and the priest shall burn them on the altar as a burnt offering, but the bull's hide in all its flesh with its head, its legs, and its entrails and offal, the whole bull he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn it on wood with fire where the ashes are poured out, it shall be burned. Now very, very important is the next verse because it's going to sound almost like verse 2, but there's going to be a little difference in it. Verse 1 and 2 deal with an individual sin, and it is unintentional. Verse 13 is an unintentional sin also, but there's a little difference. It says, now if the entire nation of Israel sins unintentionally, and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done something against any of the commandments of Yahweh in anything which should not be done and are guilty, when the sin which they have committed becomes known, then the assembly shall offer a young bull for the sin and bring it before the tabernacle of the meeting. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bull before Yahweh. Then the bull shall be killed before Yahweh. The anointing priest shall bring some of the blood of the bull to the tabernacle of the meeting. Then the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before Yahweh in front of the veil. He shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar which is before Yahweh, which is in the tabernacle of the meeting, and he shall pour the remaining blood at the base of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. He shall take all of it, the fat from it, and the burnt offering on the altar. He shall do with the burnt, strike that, he shall do with the bull as he did with the bull as a sin offering. Thus he shall do with it. So the priest shall make an atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven of them. Then he shall carry the bull outside the camp, burn it as he burned the first bull. It is a sin offering for the assembly. When the prince has sinned and done something unintentionally against any of the commandments of Yahweh his God in anything which should not be done and is guilty, or if his sin which he has committed comes to his knowledge, he shall bring as his offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. He shall lay his hand on the head of the goat and kill it at the place where they killed the burnt offering before Yahweh. It is a sin offering. Now, every time you see where it says he lay his hand on the head of the bull, he laid his hands on the head of the bull, that is a transference of energy and in biblical times as it is today, as the scripture tells you, don't lay your hands on a man suddenly. When Moses was leaving the leadership and he was about to inaugurate Yehoshua, the son of Nun, he put his hands on his head and spoke over him. Okay? When the priest would receive the offering, they would put their hands on top of the animal and transfer the sin of the people to the animal. Are you understanding? This is how this has worked. So when we get into Leviticus later on, you'll find out, especially during the uh, offerings for the Day of Atonement, you will find that Aaron had to pronounce the sins of the people on the head of one offering, and he would set one of the offerings free after he put 
the sins of the people upon it, and it went off into the wilderness. It was called the scapegoat. And that goat had all of the sins of Israel. Hear the word escape. We wanted the goat to Azazel was his name. Escape. We laid all the sins of the people on the scapegoat. And the scapegoat went off into the wilderness. And we ain't never want to see it again. So your hands and the, and the power that's in them, in the spirit, you have the ability when the people get sick, the book teaches you in the Basura, call for the elders to pray for the sick and they lay hands on them. Because in our way of life, if we understand these scriptures, if you know who you really are, that you have been chosen by the Most High, then you have a relationship where you, being the salt of the earth, have the ability to heal if you understand really what salt does for meat in a sacrifice. And it's powerful aseptiveness and it's power anti-inflammatoryness. Then you would begin to understand what Mashiach said when he told the disciples who were Israelites, you are the salt of the earth. And if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Mm-hmm. Right? So all these little things that we're reading, and some people say, well, y'all meticulous. Yes, because I want you to get it. The master wouldn't say something without it having a connection to the Torah and then it being a connection to you. All of these are shadows of something greater that was going to come, something that was greater to come in Mashiach and something that is going to be greater coming in you as an Israelite. You are a messianic people. If you are holding on to simply the Torah, you've got five books and you're missing a whole bunch of more history, prophecy, and glad tidings. But if you come to study and learn and research, then you're going to find out that you were called the people of the book for a reason. You ought to be like Hamashiach, a walking, living testimony of Yah's word. That's what you're supposed to be. This word is supposed to be in you so that if it is ingrained in you, then your acts will come out with the word being the forefront of you. You will be a living, walking example of the word. Deuteronomy 28 says, and all the people of the earth shall see you are called by the name of Yahweh, and they'll be afraid of you. That's what the book says. They will only be afraid of you, and they will only give you respect and recognition when you are engrossed, you are engulfed with this word, and then you can see that light that's in you. You, that lamp that is the light, cannot be put under a cloth. You have to be set up on a hill. And if you understand that Jerusalem sits up on a hill and the only way to get to Jerusalem is to go up to Zion, you can't go down to Zion. you got to go up. You can go down to hell. You can go down to Egypt. But you cannot go down to Jerusalem. you got to go up. Okay. you got to make Aliyah. Mm. you got to go up. Pharaoh did not want to let you go. He dealt with you shrewdly. He dealt with you wisely. America don't want to let you go. Don't you get this mistakenly twisted in your mind. The book says that Pharaoh feared the multiplication of you. Who are you, the children of Israel? And said to his officers, come, let us deal wisely with them. Lest they grow. Join unto our enemy. Remember our evil of slavery and come against us. So don't go get them up out of the land. That word that is there is aliyah. Don't let them go up out of the land. Don't let them go make aliyah. You're supposed to go make aliyah at least three times a year, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of the Tabernacles. I'm not going to go home because I'm afraid of the Israelis and the Palestinians, and there's a lot of death and killing and shooting and everything else going over there, Brother Prince. Well, in Chicago, it is the 14th day of the so-called month of January, and we have had 120 shootings and 12 brothers and sisters killed. 
Wow. So don't tell me about and how many Israelites done died in Israel in the last month? Zero. How many Israelites done died in Israel in the last year? Three. And all of them died of old age. And they were leaders, Prince Elkanon, Ben-Ami, and Sister Mahalia. And they all have been called home to glory. Let them rest. Ain't no Israelites dying in Israel the way Israelites are dying over here in hell. And what do you think is supposed to happen to you in hell? Heaven? Heaven is where you live at. That's home where the heart is. Hell is where you die. You got to get this right. Mm. Your vision is blurred because you got people standing before you telling you that it's okay to be in hell. It is never okay to be in hell. Like it's never okay to be in jail. And we were sentenced here before our disobedience. And we think that we're going to rise to be beyond number two in jail. And as I said weeks ago, it is like the prisoner thinking that he's going to elevate to become the warden. It'll never happen. Why are you holding on to the skirt tail of a whore that's about to be judged? Mm -hmm. Yes, I said it. Just that plain and simple. If you read these scriptures and you read Zechariah, if you read Jeremiah, and you read Revelation 18.4, and it tells you to come out of her, then why are we not taking the steps to come out of her? We've got to prepare to leave. And all of this here that you're learning, these things will be important to you at a latter time. They will have great significance for you because I ask Israelites all the time. When they say they're Israel, I say, where should an Israelite be? And they look at me and I say, but in Israel. If you're an Israelite, where would an Israelite be but in Israel? It's just simple intelligence. Simple, simple intelligence. Continuing on. Verse 24, verse 25, the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and pour his blood at the base of the altar of the burnt offering, the Seder. And he shall burn all his fat on the altar like the fat of the sacrifice or the peace offering so the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sins and it shall be forgiven. That's the key word there. So whenever an atonement is made, kafar, which means to expiate, right, to cover, right? So when the animal dies in the sin offering, atonement is made, it says the sin shall be forgiven. The only difference between this sin offering being forgiven and the eternal sin offering of Hamashiach being perpetual is that the blood of animals, goats, and bulls could never offer what is called a perpetual form of covering. Because every time an Israelite sinned, you had to go back and make another offering, and something innocent again had to die. So when we get into and study the book of Hebrews on the Shabbat, the words themselves will speak clearly to you why the sacrifice that is made by Hamashiach is greater than the sacrifices we are reading in Lewi or Leviticus. It continues to read this way. If any one of the common people sins unintentionally, unintentionally by doing something against any of the commandments of Yahweh and anything which should not be done and is guilty, or if his sin which he has committed becomes aware or comes to his knowledge, then he shall bring as an offering a kid of the goat, a female without blemish for his sin which he has committed. And he shall lay his hands on the head of the sin offering, kill the sin offering at the place of the burnt offering. Then the priest shall take some of his blood, with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and pour all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. He shall remove all of its fat as fat is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offering as the priest shall burn it on the altar for a sweet aroma unto Yahweh. So the priest shall make an atonement for him and it shall be forgiven. Now, this is what I be telling the brothers and sisters who claim and call themselves Torah only. And I say to them they shouldn't say that because if they say Torah only, that means that they've limited themselves to the first five books. 
Maybe they would say Tanakh only. But whatever the case may be, if something, someone sins, then you have to make an animal sacrifice to cover the sin or you don't have a relationship with the Creator. Because if you're reading it from the law rightly, it says when the offering is performed by the priest, the priest shall make an atonement for him. And verse 31 says, it shall be forgiven for him. When? When the atonement is made. Now they come and say, oh, the day of atonement, and we got to fast, and we got to sacrifice, and we got to do all this on the seventh month, on the tenth day. And yes, the day of atonement is written about in Leviticus, and yes, they're right, but they're forgetting something. That there was a high priest that went into the holiest of holies one time a year and made that sacrifice for all of us. And since we don't have a functioning, literal Levitical priesthood in Israel, among the Israelites today, then those who are holding on to their Torah-only law doctrine are lost because there are no sacrifices being offered for them because they reject the unblemished sacrifice. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Right. All right? Um, That's what we're talking about. I'm not judging them. I'm trying to forewarn them because that speaks to the pompous, self-righteous arrogance knowing that the Torah says that if you sin, you got to make a sacrifice. you got to make a sacrifice. You know, you go steal something and you've been found out because that's what we just read. Uh, Now, these are all unintentional sins. So what's an unintentional sin? Okay, here's a simple one. Not a sin unto death. Because Israelites will wrestle with this, and we've had this wrestling match in the classes, and Ima Tikva know it, Ima Zamiria know it, Maureen Nathaniel know it, others online who were in the camp. And people will argue about where the sisters were sitting at when they were going through Nida. And brothers would have a fit. And I said to them, that's an unintentional sin. So what you mean? They said, when the thing became known. So now it's no. So we would set up a place for the daughters of Zion who would come and they were partitioned off in a section. So they, they could be participants, but they were outside of all the normal activities of the community. But you don't want to ostracize them because they're going through this cycle for a period of time, seven days, if it's a normal cycle. But then someone would say, well, we didn't know where she sat on. And I take them right back to the scripture. It's an unintentional sin. And people would argue over little bitty things. This is why I'm telling you, you should focus on greater matters. It is unimportant what Abraham's sandals look like. It is unimportant what was the staff that your father, Jacob, had. Don't strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Adultery is a big thing among the Israelite community, those who claim to be conscious, who are going around telling our daughters that they are marrying them and they have no legal, lawful covenant or ketubah. That's something important. Why? Because we are perpetuating a cycle that we did when we didn't know who we were. Now you claim to know who you are and you want to quote the law, but then nobody wants to keep the law. And so I'm saying, like Hamashiach said, that he who is among us that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So you don't judge by an appearance. You don't judge by the sight of your eye or the hearing of your ear. You grab and you dig for every bit of information and you judge your righteous judgment. That means you've got to glean all the facts. And when you glean all the facts, then you have what I call the body of evidence. And when you have the body of evidence, you present that truth. Not tail-bearing, not skewing the truth through false witnessing. You grab all the information, and you make you a righteous judgment. Don't fall into the lie that you can't judge. You make judgments and decisions every day. Don't fall into the lie that nobody can judge you because the heathen judges you. He get a, You get a traffic ticket, you go to his court, and there is a Euro-Gentile judge that will judge you. Don't fall into the trap. Matthew chapter 7 teaches you that whatever measure of judgment that you render, it will be measured back to you equally, the same measure of judgment. So that's why you judge ye a righteous judgment. You must have just balances and just scales. If you're going to be a nation, 
because it's nation time, and you are practicing what it's going to be like to be that nation just in righteousness this time as we ascend and make our way up to Zion. Let me finish these last two scriptures because I don't want to hold you all beyond the time and total about for your patience. I greatly appreciate it as it reads this way. And I'm reading off. Verse 30. The priest shall take some of his blood with his finger and put the horns upon the, on the horns of the altar as a burnt offering and pour all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. He shall remove all this fat, all this fat that is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offering, and the priest shall burn it on the altar for a sweet aroma unto Yahweh. And the priest shall make atonement for him. I read this, but I'm reading it again. It shall be forgiven. If he brings a lamb as a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish. So what is allowed here is a modification of the type of animals at that time that were allowed to be permitted for offerings for the sin offering. All right? Everything, though, had to be without blemish. Going back to the principle of what we talked about hours ago. Your offerings, your prayers have to be pure and unblemished. Then he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill it as a sin offering at the place where they killed the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger, put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering, and pour out all the remaining blood at the base of the altar. He shall remove all his fat as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offering. Then the priest shall burn it on the altar according to the offerings which are made by fire unto Yahweh. So the priest shall make atonement for his sin that he has committed, and it shall be forgiven of him. That is the end of the reading of Leviticus chapter 4, verse 1 through 35. May Yahweh add clarity, enlightenment, and edification to the reading of his word. And let us close in chapter 5, verse 1 through 19. Of Leviticus, this is the trespass offering, or what I call the acknowledgement of the sin, which brings about the sin trespass offering. So this is the fifth one. This one, the difference with this, it is not going to be sweet, right? I hope y'all heard me. This offering is not going to be sweet. All the other offerings are said sweet aroma, sweet aroma. So you got to the sin offering. That sin offering, chapter 4, is non-sweet. So when you see a test question that asks you which one of the two offerings are non-sweet, that means they don't appeal to the creator like the sweet aroma did in the other three, meaning the burnt, the peace offering, right, and the, and, and the, and the shalom offering, or the shalom offering, the grain offering. But now the sin and the trespass offering are not going to have a sweet aroma to it. Chapter 5, verse 1 reads this way. If a person sins in the hearing of the utterance of an oath and is a witness, whether he has seen or known of the matter, if he does not tell it, he bears his own guilt. All right? You're a witness. You've asked the question about truth and you don't tell the truth. You are a sinner. Shalom, brother. Right? You, you've got to bear your own sin. You're guilty of it. Verse 2. Or if a person touches any unclean thing, whether it is a carcass of an unclean beast or a carcass of an unclean livestock or the carcass of an unclean creeping thing, and he is unaware of it, he shall be unclean and guilty. Or if he touches human uncleanliness, this is what we were talking about, whatever uncleanliness with which a man may be defiled, and he is unaware of it, when he realizes it, then he shall be guilty. Or if a person swears, speaking thoughtlessly, with his lips to do evil or good, whatever it is that is a man which pronounces by an oath, and he is unaware of it, when he realizes it, then he shall be guilty in any of these matters. So when we go to Matthew 5:33 and into Numbers chapter 30, which is the law regarding the oaths, this will make a, a lot more sense to you. Just remember, what you utter... By your words, you're justified, and by your words, you are 
condemn. Verse 5, it shall be when he is guilty in any of these matters that he shall confess that he has sinned in the thing, and he shall bring his trespass offering to Yahweh for his sin which he has committed. A female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goat as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin. If he is not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring unto Yahweh for his trespass offering which he has committed. Two turtle doves and two young pigeons, one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. And he shall bring them to the priest who shall offer them, which shall be offered as a sin offering first. And he shall wring off its head with his neck, but shall not divide it completely. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. And he shall offer the second as a burnt offering according to the prescribed matter, so that the priest shall make an atonement on his behalf for his sin which he has committed, and it shall be forgiven of him. But if he is not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, pay attention, then he who has sinned shall bring for his offering one-tenth of an ephod and five flour as a sin offering. And he shall put no oil on it, nor shall he put frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. Then he shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take his handful of it as a memorial portion and burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire unto Yahweh. It is a sin offering. The priest shall make atonement for him for his sin that he has committed in any of these matters, and it shall be forgiven of him. The rest shall be the priest as a grain offering. Then Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, If a person commits a trespass and sins unintentionally in regarding to any of the holy things of Yahweh, then he shall bring to Yahweh as a trespass offering a ram without blemish from the flocks, with the evaluation in the shekels of silver according to the shekel of the sanctuary as a trespass offering, which we read over in uh, Exodus chapter 30, verse 13, weeks ago. And he shall make restitution for the harm that he has done in regarding to the holy thing, and shall add one-fifth to it and give it to the priest, so that the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering, and it shall be forgiven of him. If a person sins and commits any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of Yahweh, though he does not know it, Though he does, though she does not know it, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. Have you ever heard the phrase, the ignorance of the law is no excuse? Well, that's where the Jimmy Jake Gentile got it from. Ignorance of this law is no excuse. And there are provisions that are written therein if you don't know. But when the matter has become known to you, then you shall make what? You shall make a petition before the Creator. You should make a sacrifice before the Creator. You put up your prayer today is what I'm saying to you before the Creator. And it has to be pure and unblemished. And the atonement has to be in place for you in order for it to be acceptable in His sight. I am Yahweh. This is Micah, or rather Malachi 3. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob shall not be consumed. Yah is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's congruent. This word is congruent. you got to be clear of its congruency. Verse 16 says, So the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering and shall be forgiven of him. If any person sins and commits any of these things, I'm going to say it again, which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of Yahweh, Though he does not know it, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. And he shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish from the flock with your valuation as a trespass offering. So the priest shall make an atonement for him regarding his ignorance in which he erred and did not know it, and it shall be forgiven of him. It is a trespass offering. He has certainly trespassed against Yahweh. That is the ending of the reading of Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1 through 19. May Yahweh add clarity and enlightenment and edification to the reading of his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, so let me review just these, these, these different sacrifices real quick, and I'll, I'll take a few questions. Anybody have it? 
and we got maybe one or two announcements, and then we're going to close. The first sacrifice is the burnt offering. And then the second one that we went over was the grain. And the third one we went over was the peace offering. And the fourth was the sin offering, and we just went over the trespass offering, which is related to sin. When Habashiach said that forgive those who trespass, right? You forgive those who trespassed against you. So you ask for your forgivenesses of your trespasses. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And that prayer was being taught to us by Hamashiach that this is the way we ought to pray when we were praying to the Father. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You, we, me, I, us will not have your sins forgiven until you learn how to forgive those who have trespassed against you. Whatever sins you forgive will be forgiven, and whatever sins you retain, they will be retained. Because the spirit is not right, it acts as a blemished sacrifice that will not be acceptable before the Most High. If you want your sins to be forgiven, then you've got to forgive men of their sins. You've got to forgive them, especially your brothers and sisters. And it is sad that we have come into this way of life and have been reintroduced to our, or some introduced to our ancient historical culture, and we have more in-house fussing and fighting and bickering and putting out negative information on the various different electronic airwaves that we have access to now instead of loving and building together with one another. Ecclesiastes 3 says there is a time to love and a time to hate. It is not the time to hate of the Israelites. It is a time to love and a time to refrain from hating. A time to cast stones and a time to pick them up. It is not a time to cast stones at each other. It is a time for you to pick up stones and each and every one of you are important. You have something to offer, so come and build the kingdom of the Most High and lay your brick down and build the kingdom. Don't throw stones at each other, but encourage each other to pick those stones up and lay down bricks to build the nation of the Most High on earth. David was given the kingdom of Israel, him and all his descendants forever by a covenant of salt. And so when we go into that this Shabbat, I pray that a greater point of clarity and edification and enlightenment is given unto each and every one of you. Is there any questions in chapter 4 and 5? Uh, yes, this is Zoroya from California. Got a question on, well, two questions, but got a question on chapter 5, um, verse uh, 6. And it says, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto Yahweh for his sin, which he has sinned, uh, a female from the flock, a lamb, or a kid of the goat, uh, for a sin offering. And the priest, the Kohanim, the Kohen, shall make an atonement uh, for him concerning his sin. So my question with that uh, is, could it be with uh, verse 6, the reason why it's female, is because it's pointing back or remembering um, the sin of Hawa or Eve. Oh, in the book, of, in the book of Exodus. I mean, in the book of Genesis. You mean? Right. Let me see here. Let me look at that here a little bit closer. He shall bring the trespass offering to Yahweh for his sin, which he has committed, and the female, as a female of the flock and a lamb or a kid or the goat of a sin officer, the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning that. Uh, I don't, I am not clear completely on that if it is the reasoning behind that logic that you are offering. However, I'm not going to discount it, but what I will do is I'm going to highlight this here and I'm going to read it later tonight in Hebrew and see how that would uh, correspond. And I'm going to reread verses 1 through 6 again. All right. And Toda Rabah for your question. I appreciate that. Any other question? Yes. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um. I have a question on the same verse. Actually, uh, Shalom, this is the finder, but I had a question on that same verse as well. Um, uh, chapter 5, I just want to make sure that this is the trespass offering. And as I understand it, trespass is the acknowledge of a sin, right? Acknowledging right. that you sin, but you sin anyway. Right. And that's why it's not sweet. All the other offerings that we talked about or discussed tonight were sins, but they were unintentional sins. Am I on the right track? That's true so far until you get to verse 15, but go right ahead. You're right on point so far. Go ahead. Okay. But no, no, no. That was my my question for that one. But then I wanted to know who were the common people um, in Chapter 4, verse 27, because I know the common people, you could also use a female uh, animal to, uh, for them. It says, and if any one of the common people sin through ignorance while he doeth whatever against thy commandments of the, you know, of the Father concerning these things which are not, which ought not to be done, then they are guilty. Are, are the common people the Jim Catholics, or who who are they? Oh, the common people, I should just say, in that verse. So is is that common people there Israelites, or is this common people referring to anyone outside of Israel? So now there's a couple of words that we need to look at here. And uh-huh. so the one word that could be used for common is the word eretz, which actually is for earth, land, soil, or country. Another word that could be used, which means I'm asking one of the brethren to pull this up while I am cross-referencing it. Another word that is used is ben or bane, which is people of a different class or kind. Mm -hmm. Now, pull this up out of Leviticus in that direct chapter, which is chapter 4, and verse twenty. Seven, I believe it is. How does it read in the context of that verse, Leviticus four and twenty-seven? Um, if Brother uh, Edward is on the phone still, I don't know if he's still on the line. Perhaps he is. Akia, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Could you uh, reread that uh, verse for the the, the saints uh, while I am gathering? This particular verse here out of four, four, four twenty-seven, Elder. Yes, sir. Okay, I have the the Torah here. Do you have it there, Torah? And I'm trying to find out uh, what you were referring to as common. What it says in Hebrew. And well, it's one of these three words here. I didn't go into okay, the sure. I'll go ahead and read it though. Okay. Please do. So we're so Leviticus four, Leviticus four twenty seven. Right, four twenty seven. Okay, want to be sure of that. Uh, when a ruler has sinned and done something unintentional against any of the commandments of Yahweh, is L in anything which should not be done and is guilty, or if his sin which he has committed comes to his knowledge. He shall bring as his offering a kid of the goats, a male without blemish. Uh-huh. Are you in the right? Cha- are you in the right chapter? You said, verse? Tw- you said tw- four. I'm in four twenty-seven. Right. Four twenty-seven. Oh, yeah, chapter four twenty-seven should say if. Anyone- oh, here we go. If any one of the common people sins unintentionally by doing some something against any of the commandments of Yahweh, in anything which ought not to be done and is guilty, or if his sin which he has committed comes to his knowledge, then he shall bring as his offering a kid of the goat, a female without blemish, for his sin which he has command, committed. Good question. Uh, now, okay. Tell everybody. Now, sister asked a very important question because she wanted to know if this was referring to people outside of us or uh, something to that effect, if I heard or understood her correctly. So when I look this up, someone, is that correct, my, my sister? Yes. Okay. 
So, to everybody. So, when I looked this up, and that's why I had my brother to reread it, because I wanted to then read it for myself in Ivrit, and then I'll give the definition, since you all have been so patient with this, uh, and it is important. So, let's look at it here and see how this reads in uh, the scripture itself, because uh, I find it here very interesting. So, the word that is here for sin, because I'm going to read it all the way down. Uh, is techeta uh, techeta beshgaka miam ha aretz ba a sata achat mim meshot yehawa asha. So when I get up to this word that is for common, the Hebrew word here is ha aretz of the common, referring to the common, it is Strong's number 776. And mm -hmm. 776 reads, ha -ritz. It means to be firm of the people of the earth, something large or as referring to land, meaning common, country, earth, field, ground, land, nations, way, or wilderness or worldly. So that could take upon itself because if we remember that in our midst, there were not everybody that was Israel because we had with us a mixed multitude that came up with us out of the land of uh, Mitzrayim or Egypt. So this here could be referring to, and I'm going to look at this again, uh, and I am going to look at this for the common people sins unintentionally by doing something against any of the commandments of Yahweh and anything which ought not to be done and is guilty. If his sin which he commits it comes to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering of the goats of a female without blemish for his sin which he has committed. And another thing that I notice here that in this sin, the priest mm -hmm. shall take some of his blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar and pour out all the remains of the blood at the base. And he goes through the same things as he did before with the atonement for the priest. Mm -hmm. And then there is an atonement, and that person is forgiven. So for all intents purposes, when I read this in Hebrew, the common, which is a noun here, um, for ha aritz, uh, refers to, as I read in the definition, it could be of common country, common earth, field, that which is common ground or representation of a member of a nation or way mm -hmm. people of the wilderness. So this would then refer to the mixed multitude that came up with us. Okay. I, 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 the reason why I ask that because, you know, sometimes, you know, like when I'm reading the word, you know, the Father just like, you know, he really speaks to me because if we're supposed to be the way to serve the Father, you know what I mean, the light, you know what I mean? That that makes sense to me. You know what I mean? Because so many times people just say it's just the nation of Israel that's going to, you know, that's, that's going to in, inherit the kingdom and, 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 and be there. And I'm like, you know, but that's like compartmentalizing the father because he's so, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and this just confirms, you know what I mean? And I really appreciate it. I, I really do. And that was, to me, going back to what the brother said, you know, earlier, that would, to me, when I see when they use the female, not so much to represent, like, with ease or anything like that, but because they're not with the covenant of the Father. So with this sacrifice or this offering, you will be able to use a female for the other, for the other nation or mm -hmm. for the other people. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and like I said, what he, uh, what he offered as a question and a point of reference, I think, as you all have, uh, as you have offered good questions and feedback, as he has, and others who have participated tonight, I greatly appreciate it because I believe it stimulates healthy spiritual dialogue for the edification of the body of Hamashiach and the raising up of the kingdom of the Most High. The scripture teaches us uh, as we are to come and reason together with the Most High, then the sons and daughters of the prophets who we are, we are subject to the spirit of the prophets. 
And so we should be able to sit in dialogue and discuss scripture to get the scripture to give us the understanding. That's why I went straight to the Hebrew. I wanted to see what it read here in the Hebrew and what the meaning of it was uh, in Hebrew so you all could have the original um, meaning for it and how we can use and apply it in the future. Total Rabbi, any other questions? No. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you, uh, I appreciate that. You, you, you are welcome. All right. Just, just one last question, Zeroya. Uh, yes, sir. To sum this up, in uh, Yesha Yahweh or Yesha Yahu, uh, Isaiah uh, 53, um, and I'm turning there now. Um, what, what verse are you at? Isaiah 53. Um, verses verses uh, four through six, mm-hmm. where it says, "Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. We yet we um, did esteem him stricken, smitten, smitten." I'm reading out of King James. I'm speeding fast, so that's okay. And afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we are like sheep have gone astray. We have everyone has turned to his own way, uh, and yet Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us uh, all. Um, right. Does, does, um, that pertains to all that we just went through, right? In in Yikra, uh turning concerning the different varieties of sins and trespasses that he met all of that. Yeah. Um, Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, I knew that. I just wanted to um, really just bring it out for someone who didn't know that what you got done for us. You want to offer that as a sweet sacrifice because it is more than appropriate. Uh, and this is and this is something. This is not for debate, but uh, because I have debated uh, Israelites and Muslims about this subject. I, you see Yahoo 53 that our brother uh, so properly took us to. Uh, and when you read this, um, as you said, and you read it slowly, you will see the completion of all of the five major offerings here. And yes. that he, Yahweh, and this is really critical because there's nobody else in Israel that ever fits this description. And Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. Now, now here's the, here's the key where you people begin to understand and learn scriptures. Prior to the Whittingham Bible in the 15th century, our scripture was not divided with verses. Each chapter began, and it was a continuous thought. So when you go to Isaiah 52, he's talking to Israel, the nation. And he's telling Israel to arise and put on its strength, O daughters of Zion. And as you read all of Isaiah 52, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about Israel. Then when he gets at the latter part of Isaiah 52, he begins to describe a person to Israel. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, Isaiah 52, 13. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his viscous was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Now, we, we, that's a whole other subject when I get into this, this, this Shabbat. Kings shall shut their mouths at him, for what had not been told, them they shall see, and what they had not heard, they shall consider. So if you continue into Isaiah 53, it talks about of the same personage. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of Yah been revealed? Description. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the ground. He has no form of comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. 
and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. And this is where our brother began to read. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him, stricken him, smitten by Yah, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. You better highlight and circle that. He was bruised for our iniquity. Hmm. Chastened for our peace which was laid upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we are like sheep who have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way, and Yahweh has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shears is silent. He opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and judgment, and who would declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. And if you go into Daniel chapter 9, you will read that in Daniel 70th week, it says, Hamashiach will be cut off, but not for himself. And then the prince of the people who are to come, which was Rome, would ransack the temple and burn it. So this, Isaiah 53, just like Daniel chapter 9, is a prophecy of the coming of Hamashiach. And what our brother Zariah, I hope I pronounced your name right, Aki. If I didn't, I do apologize. He laid it out very helpfully to draw that this prophecy is the shadow of he which was to come, which is the representation of all those sacrifices that you read about tonight. So, if there are any other questions, if we can hold them, I would greatly appreciate it. Let us close tonight. Let us turn towards Jerusalem and bow our heads and humble our spirits as we end tonight's lesson. I pray the Most High give you clarity and edification to the reading of his word. Abba, truly I give thanks and praise unto thee alone for allowing your Holy Spirit to come out upon us, for the good teaching spirit, for the participation of all the brothers and sisters who participated tonight. Give us your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding that you might go out and come in before us, your people, for who can judge this great people of yours. So now, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. For Yah, you are our strength and our Redeemer, O Holy One of Israel. Let all of Israel who glory, worship, and honor Yah say hallelujah. 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 do you have an announcement? Yes, I do. For all uh, the brothers and sisters and also to those who may not have heard, uh, we are going to be sending out all of the information next week for the trip to the Holy Land. Anyone who has not contacted me, please email me at Kaziel, that's K-H-A-Z-Y-E-L, the number seven, at yahoo.com, and let me know if you do plan to go so that I can send all of the information to you. I will also need the city that you're li living in and how many people who will be traveling with you if there's more than, you know, just yourself. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. All right, saints, may Yah bless you and keep you, and Yah cause his face to shine upon you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you. May Yahweh be gracious unto you, and Yahweh give you eternal and everlasting peace. Looking forward to fellowshipping with each and every one of you on the Shabbat Yom. Yah bless you. Yah kai. Shalom, shalom. Lala Tov. Lala Tov. Shalom.
Yeah. 